Mosaic, a daily news program from Worldlink TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Welcome. The news from Baghdad is that Saddam's international airport, southwest of the city, was massively bombed today during a U.S. missile attack, killing and wounding tens of people, as reported by eyewitnesses. Furthermore, Al Furat village near Baghdad's airport was also subjected to a similar missile attack. The Pentagon confirmed that a U.S. SA-18 Hornet plane was dropped while flying on a mission over Iraq. The coalition's command center released a statement saying that the plane may have been dropped by an Iraqi surface-to-air missile in Karbala. Meanwhile, the coalition's central command said that there are intense efforts to learn of the fate of the plane's crew and all the missing coalition members. The spokesman for the Central Operations Command in Qatar, General Vincent Brooks, said during his daily news conference that he has information that Iraq may bomb Shiite areas in Baghdad, then blame it on the coalition forces. Earlier, the coalition forces had expressed their fears of Iraq using their chemical weapons against them. Today, U.S. President George Bush addressed a number of soldiers in North Carolina, saying that the U.S. forces are tightening their siege of Baghdad and that Saddam Hussein's days are limited. U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell announced that they will establish a military government to keep the order in Iraq after overthrowing Saddam Hussein. After meeting in Brussels with the foreign ministers of NATO's member countries, he said during a news conference that Washington will ask the United Nations to play a role in the aftermath of the war, noting that this role has not yet been specified. Powell reiterated that the U.S. and Britain will play a crucial role regarding the future of Iraq. U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld stated that the coalition forces are very close to Baghdad, stressing that there will be upcoming difficulties. During a Pentagon briefing, Rumsfeld urged officers in the Iraqi army to revolt against the Iraqi regime, adding that Syria ignores the U.S. warnings and continues to send supplies to Iraq. Today, U.S. President George Bush addressed a number of U.S. soldiers in North Carolina, saying that the U.S. forces are tightening their siege of Baghdad and that Saddam Hussein's days are limited. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State declared that they will establish a military government to keep the order in Iraq after overthrowing Saddam Hussein. After meeting with the foreign ministers of NATO member countries, Colin Powell stated during a press conference that Washington will ask the United Nations to play a role in the aftermath of the war. However, he said that the role has not yet been specified. Powell also reiterated that the United States and Britain must play a vital role regarding the future of Iraq. The spokesman for the Central Operations Command in Qatar, General Vince Brooks, announced that he has information that the Iraqi regime may bomb the Shiite areas in Baghdad in order to accuse the U.S.-led coalition of such actions adding that the coalition forces has information that the Iraqi regime may commit such action, since it is their custom to commit such offenses against the innocent Iraqi people. But he did not provide evidence to support his claim. Furthermore, the coalition forces expressed their fears that Iraq may use their chemical weapons against them. In southwestern Iraq, the British forces surrounding al-Basra continued to bomb the city today. They lit al-Basra skies with flare bombs and fired at it with tank shells. 
On the 14th day of the U.S. and British war on Iraq, Basra days and nights were not different from any other except for one thing. The British forces were attacking al-Basra with flare bombs. British military sources reported that half of the 3rd British Artillery Division fired their flare bombs at al-Basra all at once, adding that this operation took place after the British forces received information from al-Basra that the intensity of these flare bombs scares the Iraqi troops defending the city. However, analysts believe that this operation is in preparation for an attack on al-Basra. The 3rd British Artillery Division stationed on the outskirts of al-Basra continued bombing targets in the city throughout the night using flare bombs to locate the Iraqi troops and know their movements. A British forces spokesperson said that they are working on revealing the location of the Iraqis' equipment and weapons to avoid hitting civilians. We haven't caused any civilian casualties, and our missiles are only hitting specific military targets. From the observation room, intelligence information discloses something else. News just in, the Iraqi air forces are preparing for a chemical attack on northern Basra. The military commanders were hoping that al-Basra will surrender or at least fall early. However, the field's calculations do not match up to earlier calculations. Now, they are saying that the Iraqi forces will not be easily defeated, adding that al-Basra residents will not surrender before receiving material evidence that Saddam Hussein's regime is over. The U.S. forces are racing with time in an effort to get to Baghdad. They have crossed the Euphrates River and surrounded the city of Karbala, one of the Shiite Muslims' holiest sites. According to U.S. military sources, they were able to surround the city of Karbala and cross the Euphrates River, advancing towards the capital, Baghdad. The 3rd U.S. Infantry Division now controls the al Musayyib Bridge, which is over the Euphrates River, near Karbala. They fought off two Iraqi attempts to regain control of the bridge. Now, they are approximately 64 kilometers south of Baghdad. These sources added that the U.S. forces attacked al Madina, Baghdad, and Nabugh al Dasar divisions of the Republican Guard, which are deployed in the form of an arch around southern Baghdad. Meanwhile, there still remains pockets of resistance, but they are unable to stop the coalition forces' maneuvers. The U.S. forces also attacked other sites southwest of Karbala, where there are about 2,000 of Saddam's fidayeen and al Ba'ath party fighters. A commander of one of the U.S. troops said that the Iraqi soldiers targeted their attacks against their U.S. units, which allowed for other U.S. troops to pass through a gap between East Karbala and a lake from the west. International human rights watchdog Amnesty International warned Wednesday that the use of cluster bombs by the U.S. and British forces will lead to the indiscriminate killing of civilians. The day after the bombs killed some 33 civilians and wounded some 310 in the central Iraq town of Hulla. Amnesty said the use of cluster bombs in an attack on the civilian area of al hulla constitutes an indiscriminate attack and a grave violation of international humanitarian law. Iraqi officials escorted journalists to the city of Hulla some 110 kilometers south of Baghdad for a second consecutive day on Wednesday after a residential neighborhood in Hulla had been the target of internationally banned U.S. and British cluster bombs on Tuesday, killing 33 civilians. Scenes of the dead children and women shocked the world. Speaking to journalists, Dr. Ali Khatib, a doctor at the Hella Hospital, said the bombing started 10 days ago and had left 67 people dead and 750 injured. One wounded man presented to the journalist said he was a teacher who had been taken prisoner by U.S. forces who took over his school. 
He showed an English language ID card saying the U.S. forces issued it in place of his Iraqi ID documents which they took along with his money after telling him that he was a prisoner of war and that if they saw him again they will execute him. International human rights watchdog Amnesty International warned Wednesday that the use of cluster bombs will lead to the indiscriminate killing of civilians the day after the Hilla massacre. Amnesty said the use of cluster bombs in an attack on a civilian area of al hilla constitutes an indiscriminate attack and a grave violation of international humanitarian law. The U.S. Central Command confirmed that two of its aircrafts used the so-called high-precision guided missiles in bombing targets in Baghdad. It added that it had used for the first time in combat history a new version of cluster bombs capable of defying wind and weather conditions. New York-based Human Rights Watch, in a report days ahead of the start of the invasion of Iraq, said cluster munitions dropped in the 1991 Gulf War were to blame for the deaths or injuries of more than 4,000 civilians after the fighting ended. The Iraqi army showed an American helicopter carried by a lorry moving in the streets of Baghdad. This fo footage taken by Al Manar channel camera shows that this military helicopter was previously downed by the Iraqi army who was able to capture it. Days of heavy airstrikes against Iraqi cities have taken their toll, demolishing buildings and destroying roads. But even as the war continues, many in Washington are already making plans for investment in Iraq, possibly leaving European firms out in the cold. As the ongoing U.S.-led aggression against Iraq seems still on its early days, the White House is seriously engaged in estimating the cost of war and studying ways to boost the U.S. economy by restricting the reconstruction of Iraq to U.S. companies. U.S. corporations since long have their eyes focused on wide opportunities in an Iraq that is being destroyed. Wasting no time, the White House said, the preliminary cost of war is about $75 billion, including so-called reconstruction. Experts who served on President Bill Clinton's National Security Council say those costs will be substantial. There are no uh, detailed estimates, but the crude estimates have suggested uh, reconstruction requirements over a multi-year period of anywhere between $25 and $100 billion. That would include, for example, $20 billion to rehabilitate uh, the electrical power grid, uh, $5 to $7 billion for short-term rehabilitation uh, in the oil industry, uh, many more billions uh, to improve the oil industry so that Iraq could have substantial increases in production. The U.S. Agency for International Development says one immediate focus in reconstruction will be the oil fires claimed to be set by the Iraqis during the war. Some fires will have to be extinguished and the Bush administration is coming under intense criticism for the company it chose to do the job. Halliburton won the government contracts to put the fires out, the same company that U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney ran before joining the Bush administration. With 900 million U.S. dollars in reconstruction contracts pending from the U.S. government, the Bush administration is having to defend the contracting process, one in which American companies appear to have a let up vis-a-vis -vis their European competitors. A debate has also begun over the wireless telephone standard that will be used in post-war Iraq, with the California congressman lobbying for hometown technology as a way to protect American jobs and profits. Representative Dara Laisa, a Republican from Southern California, is urging the U.S. government to build from scratch a cellular network for relief efforts based on the CDMA standard popularized by Qualcomm Incorporation, rather than the GSM standard which dominates in Europe. The move, which comes at a time of strained relations between the United States and France and Germany over the war, would ensure that royalties from the rebuilding effort flow back to U.S. companies. The U.S. government aid agency has flatly rejected criticism that it had doled out the main contracts for rebuilding post-war Iraq to a select group of U.S.-only firms. The message is if the Europeans uh, decide to invest in reconstruction in Iraq, they can give their funds to European companies, which is what they do all the time. They don't give them to American companies. So if the French want to invest in reconstruction, they can invest in their companies. I would urge them to open their process for subcontracting to American firms, which they do not normally do. 
In fact, contracts of investment in Iraq will be in the billions, and those are all projects the American and European firms are hoping to get their hands on. Dozens of Iraqis have been killed in a missile strike near Baghdad's airport as U.S. troops advancing on the Iraqi capital pounded the outskirts of the city. U.S. armored units thrust to 10 kilometers from the edge of Baghdad and planes attacked targets in and around the city in preparation for an assault on the airport. Iraqi Republican Guard divisions were moving south, setting up a potential showdown for the capital. However, U.S. and British political and military leaders say urban warfare in Baghdad could be prolonged and bloody. The power went off in most of Baghdad for the first time since the invasion started. But the U.S. military said it had not targeted Baghdad's electricity system. Three big explosions went off in central Baghdad as planes were heard overhead. Further south, U.S. troops edged forward in the holy city of Najaf, trying to tighten their grip on Nasiriya and to control bridges over the Euphrates. In northern Iraq, Kurdish fighters backed by U.S. troops advanced towards the northern oil town of Mosul, but were met by heavy machine gun and rifle fire. The mobbing of uh, Baghdad and other Iraqi cities has taken a heavy toll on the civilian population. Iraqi Information Minister Mohammad Saeed al Sahaf has said that U.S. forces killed 14 people with cluster bombs and denied that U.S. troops were near Baghdad. The United States admits that it has used cluster bombs in Iraq. Britain says it has them, but would not use them in closed areas. Human rights groups insist they should be banned. Dan Ramadan reports on the 15th day of the war. The American Central Command in Qatar laid claim that U.S. troops are outside Baghdad's main airport and positioning themselves to fight for it. The U.S. military said its armored units thrust forward to just 10 kilometers from the edge of Baghdad and were preparing to seize the city's airport and that elements of four Iraqi Republican Guard divisions were moving south to engage with the invading forces. Uh, coalition forces at this point are outside of the Baghdad airport and are positioning themselves to engage that fight at a time of our choice. But Iraq's Information Minister Mohammad Saeed al Sahaf laughed off reports that U.S. troops were closing in on Baghdad and taking up positions near its airport. They are not near Baghdad. Don't believe them. So the report Could they be morning. trapped? Could they be trapped? They, they are trapped everywhere in the country. They are trapped in Unqasr. They are trapped uh, near Basra, they are trapped near Nasiriyah, they are trapped near Najaf, they are everywhere, because we will keep them on the move. We will keep them on the move. They are nowhere. About 50 kilometers south of Baghdad, two U.S. military vehicles were destroyed and a third was seriously damaged after what was described as a sudden blast that rocked U.S. troops advancing on the capital. There was no word on casualties. Both party members vow to teach the American and British troops unforgettable lessons if they approach Baghdad. They continue to prepare themselves to defend Baghdad and could be found maintaining their trenches and positions. A Sahaf also accused U.S. forces of killing 14 people and wounding 66 others with cluster bombs and pointed out that the invaders were targeting civilians. All night there was sound of warplanes as U.S. attackers waged a relentless campaign of airstrikes in one of the worst night bombings so far. The U.S. war headquarters in Qatar said planes dropped almost 40 so-called smart bombs last night on just one military storage. Yet the Baghdad International Fair and the Red Crescent were among the sites damaged. Iraqis injured in the latest attacks were brought to Kindi Hospital in Baghdad. Doctors at the hospital said the injured had been hurt in cluster bombing by U.S. warplanes and a number of bodies were taken to the hospital morgue. In addition, the BBC had reported that British forces used cluster bombs during an air campaign close to Basra. But U.S. and British commanders insisted they were not dropping cluster bombs just yet, which are designed to kill troops over a wide area. The British forces are not using any type of cluster munitions, either from the air or with artillery. 
categorically state that. Fighting raged around the southern city of Basra and Royal Marines from 847 Squadron continued to fly missions near Basra, Iraq's second largest city. The British forces have secured much of the perimeter of the city. Using Challenger tanks and over a dozen armored personnel carriers, British troops said they captured a badly damaged factory where Iraqi militia had spearheaded fierce resistance. Iraqi television also broadcast pictures of a damaged church in Basra, which it said was hit during shelling. The U.S.-led invasion has faced tougher-than-expected resistance and still has not managed to secure the city. Iraqi Information Minister Mohammed Saeed al-Sahaf denied that British forces were closing in on the center and said Basra is in good shape. In northern Iraq, Kurdish fighters have advanced deeper into territory formerly held by Iraqi troops, and a prolonged exchange of machine gunfire could be heard in the hills west of Kalak. Airstrikes by coalition aircraft were called in by the U.S. Special Forces on the new Iraqi positions. Kalak is about 42 kilometers east of the Iraqi city of Mosul and is considered strategically important as the main road to Baghdad runs through the area. Biography of President Saddam Hussein, President of the Republic of Iraq. Personal. Born on April 28, 1937, in Tikrit, the seat of the Saladin province, where he finished his primary school. Married with five children, two boys and three girls. Academic. Escaped to Syria and thence to Egypt, where he completed his secondary school studies in 1962. Admitted into the College of Law in Cairo and attended in the period 1962-1963. Having completed his third and fourth year of studies following the July 17th revolution, he obtained a graduate degree from the College of Law. On February 1, 1976, he was awarded a Master of Art Honors degree in Military Science together with a staff degree. In 1984, the University of Baghdad awarded him honorary doctorate in law. Political career. Joined the Arab Ba'ath Socialist Party in 1956. Arrested and imprisoned for six months while he was a secondary school student over the years 1958 and 1959 for his political activities against the regime at that time. He took part in the revolutionary operation against the dictator Abdel Karim Qasim, who was prime minister in 1959. The operation resulted in the dictator receiving several shots. Saddam Hussein was wounded in the leg as a result, a shot fired from a bodyguard. Sentenced to death in absentia on February 25, 1960. Returned to Iraq after the 14th of Ramadan Revolution, February 8, 1963. Discontinued his studies at the college, when in 1963, he had to return to Baghdad to lead the revolutionary struggle against the reactionary draconian regime that had previously toppled the Ba'ath government. He was not spared by the roundup campaign waged by the authorities that began in September 4, 1964. He was arrested on October 14, 1963, with charges relating to his leadership of the Ba'ath Party's struggle against the backward regime. While he was under arrest, he completed and passed his first year studies at the College of Law. Elected as member of the Ba'ath Party's Pan-Arab National Leadership in 1965 while still under arrest. In September 1966, he was elected Deputy Secretary General of the Ba'ath Party leadership in Iraq. He escaped from prison in 1967 to resume the leadership of the Ba'ath Party struggle. 
He was once again obliged to discontinue his studies because he was chased by the secret police. On July 17, 1968, mounting the first tank that besieged the headquarter, the presidential palace of the head of the regime, he led a group of party members that forced their way into the palace in order to overthrow the reactionary regime. Saddam Hussein played a leading and key role in planning and then carrying out the revolution that day. On July 30, 1968, he was personally in charge of a swift operation to purge the new government of the July 17 revolution of certain of the old regime's figures who for purely tactical reasons cooperated with the Ba'ath Party revolutionaries. He all but officially undertook the role of Vice Chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council as early as July 1968, but was constitutionally elected for the post of Vice Chairman on November 9, 1969. On June 1, 1972, he led the process of nationalizing Western oil companies that had the monopoly of Iraq's oil. On July 1, 1974, he was dubbed the rank of Lieutenant General and awarded the Rafidine Order, first class of military type. He played a principal role in formulating and implementing the autonomy law for the Kurdish citizens on March 11, 1974. On October 8, 1977, he was elected Assistant Secretary General of the National Pan-Arab Leadership of the Ba'ath Party. Presidential career. On July 16, 1979, he was elected Secretary General of the Regional Leadership of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, Chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council and President of the Republic of Iraq. On July 17, 1979, President Saddam Hussein was promoted to the rank of Field Marshal. On October 8, 1979, he was elected Deputy Secretary General of the National Pan-Arab Leadership of the Ba'ath Party. On September 4, 1980, President Saddam Hussein led the Iraqi people and the army wisely and bravely against the aggression initiated and launched against Iraq by Ayatollah Khomeini's regime. The war ended in Iraq's great victory on August 8, 1988. On July 30, 1983, he was dubbed the Revolution Order First Class. On April 28, 1988, he was dubbed the Order of the People. President Saddam Hussein actively led the modernization of the Iraq economy, urging the construction of various developed industries and following their administration and execution. He also supervised the modernization of Iraq's countryside the mechanization of agriculture and the distribution of land to farmers. He effected a comprehensive revolution in energy industries as well as in public services such as transportation and education. He also initiated and led the national campaign for the eradication of illiteracy and the implementation of compulsory and free education in Iraq. led his country in confronting the aggression launched by 33 countries led by the U.S. that waged war against Iraq. The Iraqi confrontation that is called by Arabs and Iraqis the mother of all battles, Umm al-Ma'arik, is where Iraq stood strong against the invasion, maintaining its sovereignty and political system. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support provided by Henry and Virgilia Dakin.